The bottom line of this presentation, you, know, you heard me say earlier that sustainability is a big thing. Global sustainability and sustainable development are becoming a global priority uh, amongst um, most environmental authorities, and it's probably going to continue like that for a long, long time. If anything, the emphasis is going to grow. And I also said earlier that there is a role for PRTR in sustainable development, and nobody has yet thought about PRTR in the context of global sustainability. Uh, so I would like to provide an example of how PRTR specifically the TRI, can be used to assess global sustainability, or I should say more specifically, to probe for the application of green chemistry practices by the pharmaceutical industry sector. So I'm using the pharmaceutical industry as an example of how PRTR data can be used within the realm of sustainable development. Orlando, let's go to the second slide. And I, I know I won't uh, go too much on this because I've been saying it all day. Uh, sustainable development is an ongoing priority and uh, the, the definition that I think is uh, perhaps the best definition of sustainable development is meeting the needs of the present generation without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs and there's the citation on the slide uh, as you can see. So that when I, when I talk about sustainable development. This is really what I'm talking about. Let's go to the third slide. I mentioned earlier today this National Academy of Sciences report that challenges EPA to show more leadership in, in um, how sustainable development can be achieved. And I also mentioned earlier that it provides a lot of recommendations for EPA. And one of them is that EPA should develop a sustainability toolbox. That's the term that they use. Uh, that includes a suite of tools for use in, in the sustainability assessment and management approach. And at EPA, um, my administrator and everyone feels that the TRI is one of those tools that should go into that toolbox. And let me just say a few things about green chemistry before I uh, delve into the, the application of TRI to green chemistry. And green chemistry is basically that uh, Orlando, let's go on to slide four. You want slide four? Yes. Orlando, you want slide four? Yes, I am. Okay, good. Uh, green chemistry is that subdiscipline in chemistry that strives to develop environmentally friendly chemical products through this through synthesis pathways that neither use or generate hazardous chemicals or waste. So basically it strives for environmentally friendly manufacturing methods of making chemical products. That's essentially what it is. And it evolved in EPA. This concept evolved in EPA uh, in the early 1990s, not too long after the Pollution Prevention Act was passed in the U.S. in 1990. And the practice of green chemistry, the relevance of green chemistry to my presentation is that it's a fundamental and primary means of achieving sustainable development. Let's go on to the next slide, Orlando. Let me illustrate what green chemistry is using uh, some basic chemistry here. What you're looking at, even if you're not a chemist, uh, it, it, it's, not, it's okay. Um, you're looking at a a synthesis of acetophenone. Acetophenone is that structure that you see on the right side with the word acetophenone under it. And acetophenone is used quite a lot in industry. It's used as an intermediate to make dyes, to make drug, uh, drug products, to make a lot of different things. And the synthesis of it is very simple. You start out with phenethyl alcohol, which is that structure that you see on the left side of your screen and you react it with two chemicals, chromium three oxide and sulfuric acid, those two uh, types of chemicals in the middle there, and you get acetophenol in your product. All you're really doing here in this reaction, in this transformation, is just removing a couple of electrons off of that oxygen on phenethyl alcohol's 
So it's a very, chemically speaking, this is a very simple transformation. And of course you get your product and then you get some waste, you get chromium sulfate. But um, the chemicals that you see in red on this slide, all of them are on the TRI list of toxic chemicals, even acetophenone itself, the desired chemical. So if a facility in the United States were manufacturing acetophenone using the synthesis, they would have to use chromium trioxide, which is on the TRI list. They'd have to file a report for that. Sulfuric acid is on the TRI list. They'd have to file a report for that. And then they would have to file a report for acetophenone if they exceeded the manufacturing threshold of it and they would also have to report on the chromium sulfate waste. Let's go to the next slide, Orlando, uh, and go to the one after that number. It should be on seven. This synthesis requires the use of two TRI chemicals, one of which, the chromium trioxide, is a known human carcinogen. Let's go to the next slide. And it generates a TRI chemical, the chromium sulfate, which is also a known human carcinogen generates a lot of that chemical as a waste and a large quantity. And let's go to the next slide. So when all is said and done, this transformation or this manufacturing method is only 42% efficient because of all that waste that is created, that chromium sulfate waste that you see. And for many years, I mean, this is, this is how chemistry has been done in industry. It's, uh, there's been very little regard for the environmental impact of the chemicals that are used, for the safety of the chemicals that are used. Uh, this is terrible chemistry. This is bad chemistry. It's because of this type of chemistry that we have environmental authorities, uh, such as the US EPA and others. Let's go to the next slide, Orlando. Now, a green way of making acetophenone is that you just simply start out with phenethyl alcohol, as you see on bottom, and you react it with molecular oxygen in the presence of a catalyst, and bingo, you get your desired product without the use of chromium trioxide or sulfuric acid, and you don't generate any chromium sulfate waste. So the overall efficiency of this reaction is almost 90%. So this is a very clean, or I should say green way of making acetophenol. So this is what green chemistry is. I just wanted to illustrate that to you. Let's go to the next slide. Now, a lot of uh, industries have been implementing green chemistry practices over the past 10 to 15 years in varying degrees, but it's particularly um, uh, common in the pharmaceutical manufacturing sector. Many drugs nowadays are made from green syntheses, or the, the pharmaceutical sectors have implemented green chemistry practices. Some of the, I'll just mention a few here, Biagra, Genuvia, um, Birica. These are very widely used medications. Uh, Genuvia, by the way, that uh, developed by Merck and Company, they, EPA gave its Presidential Green Chemistry a Challenge Award to the Merck Company because of their synthesis. Uh, you can get more examples of these if you go to the Green Chemistry Institute's Pharmaceutical Roundtable website. There are many more examples. Let's go to the next slide, Orlando. So we should be on slide 12, and I think what's most pronounced in pharmaceutical manufacturing is that they've cut down on the quantities and number of toxic solvents that they use. Drug development has historically required huge quantities of organic solvents. And I'm going to use Viagra as an example here. The, uh, everybody okay there? I heard, I heard a noise when I said Viagra. Is everybody okay? All right, I, I guess that means yes. Um, the original synthesis of Viagra, what you're looking at here, these columns that you're looking at, the colors, each color that you see represents a solvent. And the width of the solvent band represents the quantity. So the, the color is a specific solvent, and the width of the band represents the magnitude and volume of how much solvent is used. So if you look on the extreme left, and you see the, the original synthesis 
to make Viagra and involved an awful lot of methylene chloride, that orange solvent, and also some acetone and a few other solvents. So to make one kilogram of Viagra required about 1,300 liters of organic solvents. Over time, the Pfizer pharmaceutical company has developed, has modified their synthetic approach to Viagra, where they've cut down tremendously, not only on the quantities of solvents, but also on the types of solvents. They no longer use, for example, methylene chloride uh, in their synthesis methods. Now they've gotten the synthesis down from 1,300 liters per kilogram down to about seven liters per kilogram. Uh, to make uh, Viagra, and they, and they think they can do better than that, and they are. They're going to try to do better than that. But this is just one of many examples of, of how green chemistry has cut down on the, on the uh, use of toxic solvents in synthesis of pharmaceuticals. Let's go to the next slide. So we should be on slide 13. So what I wanted to do, I wanted this test. I said to myself, well, if the pharmaceutical manufacturing firm are implementing green chemistry practices, then I should see these results showing up in the TRI data set, or more specifically what I should see are decreases in the releases of toxic chemicals reported by the pharmaceutical sector over time. So that's what I set out to do. And what I have here, we should be on slide 13. That here is a a picture over time from 2001 through 2009 of what the pharmaceutical sector has reported to the U.S. EPA, the Toxic Release Inventory Program. The x, the y-axis on the left is millions of pounds, and the uh, submitted by pharma. You know, that's in aggregate. That's the total quantities of releases submitted by the pharmaceutical manufacturing sector as a whole, and the quantities on the right. Uh, that's, I mean to say the right of the y-axis on the right side is millions of pounds by the manufacturing sector as a whole. So let me explain these lines. That top dark blue line that you see represents the manufacturing industry as a whole, the chemical manufacturing industry as a whole. The dotted line uh, is normalized for changes in the economy, you know, just the uh, uh, economic fluctuations within the United States. The lighter blue line below represents the pharma sector, pharmaceutical manufacturing firms. Now, as you can see, over time, from 2001 to 2009, the manufacturing sector as a whole, the chemical manufacturing sector as a whole, has dropped their releases in the order of about 30%. That's pretty good. Even when you normalize for plants closing down or outsourcing um, all of that, we still see this, you know, significant decrease in releases being reported to the EPA. When you look at pharma, though, the pharma sector, you see a tremendous decrease in releases of toxic chemicals that they've reported. It's more in the order of 75 to 80 percent, uh, much greater than, uh, than the manufacturing sector as a whole. So they kind of stand out. Now, let's go to the next slide, Orlando. The same is true with the total production-related waste that is reported by the pharma sector relative to the manufacturing industry as a whole. Uh, what I mean by total production-related waste are not just the release quantities, but also the quantities of chemicals that are recycled or uh, burned for energy recovery or treated for destruction. Even here we see uh, this tremendous drop by the pharma sector, and I attribute these changes, these pronounced changes, due to their implementation of green chemistry practices. So what I know from this is that the implementation of green chemistry practices by the pharma sector does show up in the, in the TRI data set. That's not too surprising. Um, let's go to the next slide here, slide number 15. And uh, this is just illustrating that it's not just within its, these changes occur throughout the whole pharmaceutical sector. It's not just certain companies that are driving it. It's, it's, it's spread throughout the whole uh, pharma sector, which again, isn't too surprising. 
Let's go to slide 16. So what are the conclusions? My preliminary conclusions is that I think that the, 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 the TRI is, is a good tool for showing green chemistry, implementation of green chemistry practices by the pharmaceutical industry. So it's reflected in the TRI data. Now, what that tells me is that if you just flip that over, we can use the TRI or any PRTR data set for that matter to identify those industry sectors that have not implemented green chemistry practices. And I think that's the most important thing here. We're not interested so much in who has implemented green chemistry practices. I think we should be more interested in identifying those sectors that have not implemented green chemistry practices, and we need to find out why, and we need to address their needs, uh, perhaps through um, funding basic research to, uh, to help them overcome any challenges that they, that they may be experiencing. But right now where I am, that I'm, I'm continuing this research to identify those specific chemicals for which the pharmaceutical industry reports fewer releases, fewer quantities. I know that a lot of them are solvents, but there are other chemicals too. Let's go to the next slide, Orlando. Uh, I'm just about done here. I want to acknowledge um, APT Associates, my technical consultants, uh, specifically Dana Lazarus and Cheryl Keenan and Becca Fink uh, for a lot of their help. And I'm also uh, collaborating with um, George Washington University, Dr. Adelina vouchkova Costel, a well-known green chemist, and her student, Catherine Monroe. So uh, this, is a, this, I think, is a good example of the power of PRTR and where it fits in. Uh, 